Hello, and welcome to ECMATH. Today, we are going to do some thinking about radicals. First problem. Um, it came up in class that it felt like we were a little hazy on reducing square roots. So we're just going to do three different types of square roots that you might want to reduce. Let's take a look at the square root of 800. So when we're reducing roots, what we're really thinking about is factors, and we want to think about the different factors of this number. So what I'm going to do is take 800 and ignore the fact that there's a square root there for a second and just make a factor tree. When you're making a factor tree, I think the most important thing to do is just do it. So that means pick whatever factors you think are the, that you see first. Um, that doesn't mean they're always going to be like the most efficient factors, but the time you spend thinking about factors is better spent like reducing the root and doing the math instead of kind of just thinking. Uh, so that's why I said 8 and 100 is the first thing that came to my mind. So I'm continuing the factor tree. Now I do know that this factor tree could continue. I could continue this all the way down and say this is 2, 2, 10, and 10, and 2, and 5, and 2, and 5. But honestly, everything I just did in red there is extra work because of the problem I'm trying to do. I'm trying to reduce the square root of 800. So I'm going to erase everything in red and go back and put square roots over all the numbers in the base of the factor tree. And maybe you'll see why I chose to stop where I did. So I'm taking the numbers that are in the base of the factor tree, 4, 2, and 100, and rewriting them just up here back with the uh, root underneath square roots on their own. And there's this product property of square roots that allows you to split square roots up into multiple pieces. Um, so 4, 100, and 2 are the way I've chosen to split it. And the reason I've chosen to split it this way is that square root of 4 is 2, square root of 100 is 10, and square root of 2 is the square root of 2. And then this will all kind of combine together. These two will combine and make 20. And the square root of two is just the square root of two. And so square root of 800 reduces to 20 times the square root of two. That was, I think, the most efficient way to solve this problem. But I'm also gonna go back. I've put those red numbers back. And we're gonna look at what would happen if you did make the full factor tree. Um, maybe you factored 800 in some other way where you didn't see that 100 right away. Uh, and you got the full factor tree down then what would you do if you're trying to reduce the square root? Because sometimes the numbers won't be as nice as 800, and so we have to make a full factor tree just to figure out what's going on. Um, when you make the full factor tree, then what I would like to do is highlight or circle, I'm gonna use highlighter because I'm on the computer, highlight or circle all of the, the roots of the factor tree, the prime numbers that are at the base of the factor tree. So everything that's not highlighted is not prime and was divided further, but all the twos and all the fives are completely prime. So then what I'm gonna do is I'm leaving uh, all this work up here up. I'm going to come down here and solve this problem again. So I want to say square root of 800 is equal to... And I did reorder a little bit so, I could, I, I, so that I could group all the twos together. Scroll up. Uh, you could then take those twos and group them in terms of everything that's a perfect square because we know kind of from our other studies of square roots that the square root of any x squared for no matter what x is, uh, as long as x is positive at least, is equal to x. And since 2 is greater than 0, I'm not worrying about any absolute value things. So then I'm going to do the square root of 2 squared is 2. The square root of 2 squared is 2. The square root of 2 is the square root of 2, and the square root of 5 squared is 5. And so any time that you made the full prime factorization, you would group things in perfect squares because that's the opposite operation of a square root. Um, I like this understanding because when we go back to cube roots, well, that's going to be really useful. And then, of course, that second method does reduce out the same way as the first one down to 20 root 2. All right, going on to the next problem, we have the square root of 512. Um, 512 seems like a less nice number than 800, uh, unless you've been playing that phone game 2048, in which case you know that 512 is an even power of 2. So if you just give me a second, I'm going to make the factor tree for 512, and we'll see what's going on.
Now, I could keep going and make the whole down factor tree to figure out what power of 2 this is. That might be a nice way to do it. But you know what? I see 64, and I know 64 is a perfect square. So why am I going to keep doing more work when all I really need to do is write this as the square root of 2 to the third times 64. I mean, I've got the 2 to the third from here, here, and here. So then I'm just going to proceed to break that up. This is going to be um, 2 square root of 2 times 8. So 2 to the third uh, has a 2 squared and then 1 left over 2. That's this guy. And then the square root of 64 is that 8. So this just becomes 16, 2 times 8 square root of 2. One last square root to reduce. This time we have the square root of 2,205. Uh, I chose this number because I know it has some factors, although now I've forgotten what they are. So what I'm going to do is just, again, try to make that factor tree. Um, let's see what happens. So the first thing I noticed, just thinking out loud, is that this thing ends with 5. So the first thing I'm going to try is dividing us by 5 and see where that leads us. So 441, it's not even. Um, I noticed that it might be divisible by nine. And the reason is that uh, it's one of those old divisibility tricks. The sum of the digits adds to nine. So this might be divisible by nine. I'm gonna try that and see what happens. Ah, and when I divide by nine, I get 49. So let's write that out. Uh, so I had nine and 49. And this is actually really nice because 49 is a perfect square. So I'm not gonna continue this factor tree any further. Um, I guess maybe in red, I'll write down here, 49 is seven times seven, but I don't need to do that really, because I know that this is 49. I also, I guess, know that nine is three times three, um, but nine and 49 are both perfect squares. So when I rewrite this whole thing out after I've done that, that tracking. And by the way, if you didn't know the divisibility trick for 441, then you would just start guessing chucking. You would try, you'd skip two, you maybe try three. It, uh, three would actually work. You'd try um, five, might not, wouldn't work. Uh, seven would work, right? So you just keep guessing and checking. Um, but if you know some of those divisibility tricks, it can save you some time, especially with nines. Uh, all right, so we're gonna write this critter out. This is the square root of five times nine times 49, that's gonna be the same as the square root of five times three times seven, or 21 square root of five. And that's it. That's all it takes to reduce a square root like that, even if the number is really gross. And now we're gonna move on to the next section of the video, which is more about uh, other square root tricks. So we are gonna do some more reducing as we go, but that was kind of our primer on reducing. Now what I'm really gonna do is just uh, a couple homework problems from the textbook and talk them out loud, see what it looks like, and see where we end up. Uh, the first one has sort of a special direction. Um, it says simplify, but it also says assume that x is greater than zero. So again, the reason they say that is so that we don't have to worry about anything, any of the rules about uh, absolute value of x squared, or square root of x squared being the absolute value of x. We can just uh, safely ignore that absolute value stuff and just say uh, that those will reduce to x. Now that's not going to be true later on. There will be some absolute values going on, uh, but they're just simplifying it for us for now. Uh, so if I wanted to reduce this guy, um, this looks like a lot of stuff and I want to be really careful. Um, the very first step when I have something like this with a root on top and it has to be over the entire top of the fraction and the entire bottom of the fraction. So this would not be allowed if this was something like uh, square root of x plus one outside over square root of two x. Not allowed. Um, but when something's like this, you are allowed to write everything under one square root. 500 x to the third over 10 x to the negative first. And then for a moment, I'm just gonna think about the bottom, uh, or the bottom, the inside, and ignore the fact that there's a square root around that around it and see what I can simplify. So I'm going to keep writing that square root. Oh, that's really messy. And just start to simplify. Now I have an x to the negative 1, but it's on the bottom. 
So what I'm gonna do is just move that to become an X to the first on top, not combine it with the three at the moment. I'd like to do that in two steps. I think trying to uh, combine it, at least as, as you first learn, is a little bit tricky. So I'll just keep a one down there as a placeholder. Um, also the 50 and 10 reduced to right 50 over one. So there's another reason to keep that one down there. Um, it's just to keep numbers in the right place. When you have exponent shell fractions, what I notice a lot is students will have the correct numbers, but they'll be on the wrong uh, top or bottom of the fraction. So keeping those placeholders, I think is a super good trick for avoiding mistakes like that. All right, so then this is gonna be square root 50 x to the fourth. Okay, um, well, so we might think we're done, but remember that now we have a square root out, out front and there's work that can be done with those square roots. So we're gonna come over here. Let's say uh, this breaks up into square root 50. Square root of x to the fourth. Hmm, okay, well the square root of 50, 50 is 25 and two. So that's gonna be five square root of two. Thinking about those perfect squares and how they reduce out, uh, just like the previous examples. Now the square root of x to the fourth, isn't that x squared times x squared? So the square root of something squared is just gonna be that x, just like our square root rule up front. Um, and x is positive, although it's also x squared, so we don't really have to worry about it. Uh, so this is just gonna be x squared. This is a little awkward. Um, it's usually conventional to write the square roots at the end. So you'll probably see this written as five x squared root two as a final answer. So that was pretty cool. Um, you had to combine some roots, do something, and then disassemble the roots back and reduce them. And notice how they reduced a whole lot more nicely. I don't know what a square root of x cubed would reduce to, but it probably wouldn't be very nice. And a square root of a negative exponent, that's extra not nice. But when you use that root rule to combine them, well, it all comes together really well. All right, we're gonna keep scrolling to the next problem. Oh my gosh, rationalizing a denominator. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember from class, but we talked about why you might rationalize the denominator. Remember that this is some gross decimal. And back in the old day before you had an actual calculator, if you wanted to find out the decimal for the whole thing, well, guess what? you would be stuck doing long division. And in this particular one, you'd have 11 on the inside. And that's fine, like we can do a long division on 11. You might do 11.00 or something. But on the outside, you have whatever gross thing this is. And I can't think of a time when I wanna do this. I'm sure you don't wanna do this. Basically, no one liked to do this. So we needed a different trick. Um, now the trick when you have just one term outside, like say just root seven or just root three, is to do times that root over that root. Um, and maybe we could say, well, could we do like root 21 um, or something to get the seven and the three? You can try it, it ain't gonna work. The thing that we need here is something called the conjugate. Conjugate is the same word root as conjugate in Spanish, where you might join a word in its ending. Uh, a conjugate pair of numbers is two uh, numbers with two terms each, that when you multiply them together, good stuff happens. So the basic form of a conjugate pair is A plus B and A minus B. And any number of those form is a conjugate pair because when you multiply these out, you get A squared you get ba you get uh where am i at? a b minus so the ba minus the a b is going to reduce out and then you get a negative b squared and so all together all this comes out to be is a squared minus b squared. If this, you're like, where's this coming from? If this seems a little foreign, I encourage you to pause the video and just really multiply those things out. So it's super important to remember this conjugate pair relationship. It's going to be really useful for roots. It's also going to be really useful for, useful for complex numbers. It's also really useful for factoring. It basically shows up all the time. Um, so if there's anything that you're going to really, really want to force yourself to practice in math for, um, it's this. So let's use this idea of conjugate 
to rationalize this guy. So I do have to multiply by the same thing on the top and the bottom because what I'm secretly multiplying by, of course, is the number one. But I can't just multiply by one, that won't do it. Uh, but I can multiply by like a weird version of one and that, that will achieve what I want it to achieve. So let's do this multiplication now. I'm just gonna uh, do the calculation and see what it looks like. I'm choosing not to write the middle terms um, because I'm using a factoring pattern. I know that this is A and this is B. And so this is gonna have the form A squared minus B squared and that the middle terms, which would have been um, root 21 plus and minus will drop out. And again, if you don't believe me, do it out longhand on your own paper. I always encourage you to pause these videos and do work if you're not sure. All right, continuing. I'm gonna do just a piece of scratch work down here so that this can be my final answer. Um, root seven squared is seven, root three squared is three. So altogether that's four. That's what I'm gonna put down here. And so 11 root seven plus 11 root three, all divided by four. Once you reach this step, you should check that four and the number up there, the number on the bottom and the numbers on top don't uh, secretly reduce down. Sometimes they will. In this case though, 11 is prime, so it's not gonna reduce down. And this is a 100% lovely final answer. Just showing you that problem all together for a sec um, before we move on. All right, we are gonna move on to another type of problem. So this is not a rationalizing problem. It is a cube root. And our job is just to simplify and reduce. Uh, and that's basically our job for the rest of these. So let's take a look. Uh, this feels like reducing square roots, um, just like I was wanting to do before. So let me think about 150. I'm just gonna make a factor tree for it. So looking at this factor tree, um, if this was a something that would reduce, I would expect to see groups of three in the prime factorization. I do see two fives, right? I see that five and that five, but I don't see uh, a third five that would make this reduce ni nicely. So I think this one actually turns out to not reduce at all. That wasn't very satisfying, was it? Didn't reduce. So I'm gonna try a really, really simple, uh, or a simple is the wrong word, similar problem. The cube root of 750. And the reason this is a similar problem is because 750 is five times 150, which we already established has a prime factorization of two, five, three, five. So when I rewrite this guy, I'm gonna write it as the cube root of five cubed times two times three. Now in this case, the cube root of five cubed is five and two times three, that's not a perfect cube. So I'm just gonna write that as the cube root of six. And that's how you might reduce something with a cube root. If you have a cube root, you're looking to make perfect cubes out of the prime factorization. Um, especially when you're doing cubes, it's a, most of us don't memorize perfect cubes. I don't, I, like I know a few, um, but not 750. I didn't realize that that had a perfect cube involved. Um, so it's probably easier to do the, the whole factor tree than it is for square roots where maybe you can see a perfect square factor right away. Um, I like to boil these all the way down to those prime factorizations when it's cube roots. All right, moving on to the next problem. We have more cube roots. We have the cube root of 12 times the cube root of four. So. The first thing when I see something like this, and I think, well, I'd like to reduce it. Uh, maybe cube root of 12 would reduce. It doesn't seem like it's like exactly a perfect cube, and neither does um, 4 seem like it's a perfect cube. Um, I also notice, I think in my head, there's a lot of factors of 2 in 12 and 4, so maybe if I combine everything together, I can make something work. So I'm just going to write this as the cube root of 12 
times 4. And then, instead of multiplying 12 times 4, like, we could say that that's 48, but honestly, probably the safest thing is to keep your numbers small. Um, so at this point, I'm going to make a factor tree for this. Uh, 12 is 2 and 6, which is 2 and 3. 4 is 2 and 2. And if you make factor trees for all of the numbers, like, underneath the root, without multiplying them together, that's got to be the same as the factor tree for 12 times 4, um, or 48. So then I'm going to rewrite this cube root again in order as 2 to the third times 2 times 3. Now, why don't you think I just wrote all the cubes as uh, 2 to the fourth? There's four of them, right? Well, it's because I'm looking for this pattern, cube and cube. So when I group the numbers, I'm grouping them intentionally, thinking about the step that's coming next. So the cube root of 2 to the third, that's going to be 2. So, and then I'm going to be left with the cube root of 2 times 3, which is 6. So 2 times the cube root of 6 would be the best way to boil this guy down. Uh, that was kind of fun. That seemed really hard at first, um, but with a little bit of strategy, it's not really that bad. Let's try another problem like that. So here uh, we have a fourth root and we have a fraction. So we're just like getting a little bit more complicated, but we're gonna see where it goes. So when we have a fraction of a root, first thing to do is write it as one big root. That's true with square roots, it's also true with fourth roots. So we've got 162. Now there are some things that are gonna cancel out here, so I'm gonna reduce those down. Oh, that's 81. That was a fourth root. Oh, and now I think I see what's about to happen. So I'm going to split this right now. Uh, the one is going to go away, and this is going to become the fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of x to the fourth. 81 is 9 times 9 which is three times three times three is three. And hey, how many threes are there? Four of them. So the fourth root of 81 is the fourth root of three to the fourth, or three. The fourth root of x to the fourth, that's gonna be absolute value of x. Uh, remember that this is an absolute value because in this problem they didn't give us any clues about x and if x were to be negative we're not sure we would take it to the fourth power it would become positive and the principal root rule says that when a root's on the page like it was in this problem it's assumed to be the positive version so we can't fairly say that it's just x cancels out but we can say it's absolute value of x which is almost as good so a final answer here might be something like three times the absolute value of x. Which again, that's a pretty nice reduction of something that was really gross at the start up there. Here we have another problem. Uh, so we thought we were in roots, but now we have one that's just exponents. Do remember though, uh, based on everything we talked about in class, that a fractional exponent is related to being a root. Uh, for example, x to the one half is the same as the square root of x. x to the two-thirds is the cube root of x squared or the cube root of x squared uh, and sort of all these other things. So the fraction in an exponent tells you the index of the root. Any number on top or number outside is just going to be like function like a regular exponent. Uh, and then the other rule, of course, with fractional exponents is the same, the rule that regular exponent rules are still the rules. Um, so for this one, we are going to do the top part first. This 4 applies to both terms here in the parentheses. That's why those parentheses are there. So this is going to become 2 to the 4th, y to the 4 fifths over y to the 3 tenths. So at this point, 2 to the 4th is fully reduced and nothing else is a number. So that 2 to the 4th is just going to be 2 to the 4th. Um, we've talked about it is okay to just leave that as 2 to the 4th. 
So I'm just going to leave it right there. Um, it's nice to leave numbers with their just exponents instead of multiplying them out. It makes it easier to cancel things out later if you if you do have other numbers going on. So leave that there. Uh, then I'm going to write this complete without a fraction because if I know that y to the a over y to the b is y to the a minus b just in general and that rule works with numbers, works with um, symbols, it works with fractions too. This is going to be times y to the 4 fifths minus 3 tenths. And then really all we're doing is math on this lovely fraction up here. So let's do that. So when you do 8 tenths minus 3 tenths, right, that 4 fifths uh, needs a common denominator, you get 5 tenths, and 5 tenths reduces to 1 half. So when you have a fractional exponent like that, you can reduce the fractions. Um, it's okay to probably leave your answer exactly like that, or now that we know what uh, something to the 1 half power is, you could write this as 2 to the 4th times the square root of y. And either of those answers would be acceptable. So that was a problem with uh, fractional exponents that became roots, and you had to do some fraction math and division in the middle, but it's not really that bad. Here we have another type of object, so there's no variables anymore, uh, but we have something like the fourth root of seven squared. And this is a, an awkward statement because usually the number inside is bigger than the number outside the index of the radical. Um, and this is not that case. So it's kind of hard to see how this might reduce unless you write it as fractional exponents. So this is like seven squared, seven squared to the one fourth. Well, when you have an exponent of an exponent, you multiply those together. So that's gonna be like seven to the two fourths, which is the same as seven to the one half, which is the same as the square root of two of seven. So uh, you have these kind of canceling uh, pieces of the root. When you write it as a fraction, you can see some relationships that don't obvi always seem obviously true. And that's one of the benefits of fractional exponents. Next one, fourth root of x to the 12th. All right, so I do have an x here that I don't know if it's positive or negative. So I'm gonna have to sort of have um, absolute values in the back of my mind. Uh, but I also see that fourth root here. I also see uh, x to the 12th is larger than four, so that might be nice. So let's see what happens. Um, this is like x to the 12 over four, since that four is like a one fourth power. I'm gonna go ahead and just multiply those together. That's similar to x to the third. Now I wanna think about if I need an absolute value here. Um, if x was negative, then x to the 12th would become positive. And then the fourth root of x to the 12th would stay positive. But if x was negative, then x to the third would stay negative. And so saying that a positive is equal to a negative doesn't seem quite true. So I think in this case, because we're doing this even root of an even power, I think we need some absolute values around x to the third. It's gonna have the same value uh, numerically, but the sign might be wrong because we did have a 12th power there. And when we, re when we reduce that down to x to the third, we kind of lose that information. Um, and so although numerically that would be the same number, you might have wrong differing signs. And of course, when we, it says simplify or reduce, we wanna have something that would be equivalent to the original. We don't want to do any changes to that original. Proceeding fourth, I believe this is our last problem. Oh no, we have two more. Um, proceeding fourth though, these are from the very end of the chapter. These are our practice plus problems. And I think you can see why. Uh, they have a little bit of everything here. We've got fractional exponents, inside, outside, negatives, inside, outside, uh, some numbers just hanging out there too with a, a fractional root that I feels like we're probably gonna have to reduce. So I'm just gonna kind of do this problem and talk you through it uh, in a way that I might do it. And that you might have a better way to do it. 
In fact, what I'd like you to do at this point is maybe pause the video before I talk too much. Try it. And then maybe you'll find a better way than I will. Did you pause the video? Great. Now let's do it. Um, so I think in this one, the first thing I would like to do is deal with those exponents outside, especially because I see a couple things. I see a one third and a three. So I feel like reducing will happen here. And actually six would divide by three as well. Uh, and then over here, I see a six, a three and a six. So I feel like a lot of stuff is gonna reduce as soon as we bring those exponents into each term. So this first one is gonna be, I'm gonna write it without parentheses. I'm just kind of separate it maybe at the middle. It's gonna be eight to the one third, x to the negative six thirds, and y to the three thirds. And then I'm gonna keep that multiplication symbol in the middle, although it's not strictly necessary. x to the 30 sixths, y to the negative six thirds. Now, you probably could have skipped these and directly reduced them, but I'm just choosing to write them out uh, the longer way at the moment. Um, this is 36 because five times six, uh, five over six times six over one is 30 over six. Okay, now I've gotten rid of all the parentheses. I'm gonna reduce stuff down a little bit and rewrite. Eight to the one third, instead of leaving that, that's the same as the cube root of eight, which we do know is two. Two times two times two is eight. Uh, then I have here x to the negative 2. This becomes a y, 3 thirds is 1. Um, 30 over 6, that's x to the 5th. And y to the negative 2nd, right, negative 6 thirds. All right, so now I just have to combine and reduce these terms. So what I'm going to do is uh, just go to numbers, then x's, and then y's, grouping together as needed. 2 check. I'm worried about that. Let's look at the x's. I have x to the fifth, x to the negative two. Um, when they're on the same like level, right, there's no fractions, I'm going to add the exponents and that becomes like five minus two. So that's x to the third. Here I have y and y to the negative second. Uh, so I've done the x's, I'm moving to the y's. y and y to the negative second, that's going to be y to the negative first, right? One y to the first minus two, because I'm adding them adding a negative is like subtracting. Two uh, x to the third, y to the negative first. This is again, like so much nicer. It's not yet done though, because that negative exponent is, we're gonna consider that uh, not nice, right? You want fractions that people that don't understand negative exponents could understand. Uh, so the best thing to do here is to say, okay, this is two x to the third. Now when you have something to the negative one, that's saying create a fraction put it on the bottom. This is y to the first power, although I'm not gonna, I'm gonna delete that and not write it because it's technically not strictly necessary. So here's that problem altogether. This is one that looks really scary, but it just takes a little bit of persistence and consistence in getting your fractions math, uh, fraction math right all the time. And then we'd have one last problem today, and then we will end this video and let you guys actually do some problems. So we have exponents, fractions, uh, more fractions, right? We've got kind of like a complex fraction. We've got negative exponents all over the place. This one's gonna be fun. Again, please pause the video right now. Try this out on your own paper, write it down, do it. I hope that went well. Let's do it together. So this problem, I have a couple strategies. I could try to simplify these y's inside. I notice a couple things. They have a common denominator. Uh, so those would subtract nicely and I could get rid of that fraction inside. In this case though, I think I'm gonna choose a different path. And the reason is because I see four, four, four. And I also see negative, negative, negative. So if I make the choice to bring this four to all three terms here, I think things are gonna cancel nicely and I will end up with more positives and less negatives and that's gonna make life a lot easier. So I'm gonna do that. So this would be x to the negative four halves times y to the positive seven 
So when I do negative four times seven fourths, those fours are gonna cancel and the negatives are gonna cancel. I'm not gonna show that step. You should not show that step. You should be confident enough in your fractions to know that that's gonna happen. So we get y to the seventh. In fact, I'm gonna go back and reduce this x term. It was four halves now, but negative four divided by two is negative two. Uh, go ahead and go straight there. And then on the bottom here, uh, negative five fourths times negative four is gonna be y just to the positive fifth. And oh my gosh, all of a sudden, some very nice things have happened. Every fraction went away. Most of the negatives went away. Uh, it looks like I really just have two more steps before I can complete this problem. So the first step is gonna be uh, dealing with the x's. So I can do all these steps in one line. I don't have to make two lines. Uh, when I have something to the negative two, that means move it to the bottom of the fraction, make it positive. So this is gonna be x squared. And when I have a fraction of a fraction, even, uh, even though they're both positive, what that means is you do y to the seventh uh, minus five, y to the seven minus five all over one. Um, you can also think about that as seven copies of y canceling with uh, five copies of y leaving y the second on the top. And this whole thing, all it comes down to is y squared over x squared. And that's probably the best place to leave it. You could, of course, also write it if you were feeling saucy as y over x squared, I think would be sort of an equally acceptable simplified form. So again, just like the last one, um, persistence with the, the calculations, uh, some strategy about what step to do first to cancel fractions, get your numbers small. Uh, all these things turn out nicely. We didn't actually have to do any roots here. If we were, this was all exponents, this didn't need to be in the root chapter, which is kind of cool, actually. Uh, so that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this video on radicals and radical exponents. Please do some problems. Come in for help if you need. Ask me anything. Um, you know, hit those buttons down low. Uh, like, subscribe, all that goodness, so that when we get a new video, you're ready to watch it right away. Uh, and I will see you guys at school. This has been Math. Have a lovely day.